It's 12 o'clock noon in Los Angeles, and you know what that means, don't you? It's time for another exciting episode of Taxi TV Live! And the crowd goes wild. Hello, everybody. How are you guys? I'm going to pop out that earphone because I don't need it. And tonight, today, <laughs> sorry, for some of us it's nighttime. Today we're going to talk about the 10 myths of creating film and TV music. This should be really, really good. I think so anyway, because I wrote it. <laughs> All right, uh, let me get the chat room open here. There you guys are. Hello, everybody. Let's see if I'm there. Excellent connection. It says, yay, we are good to go. How are you guys? All right, so we've got a lot of ground to cover tonight, today. <laughs> are you guys seeing me? Yeah, you're there, right? I'm there. <laughs> it's 10 o'clock where I am. I'm loopy. Uh, excellent connection. Okay, you've got me. All right, so once again, we're doing the 10 myths of creating film and TV music. Uh, I've got 13 pages of notes, so I'm going to try and get through this quickly. I haven't rehearsed it, so I have no idea if it's going to be something that's going to last a half an hour or 90 minutes. We shall see. Um, so let's jump right in and start with myth number one. All music has the same chance of being used, so just do what you do and the marketplace will find you. Personally, I've heard that said and I think it's BS. It's not true. A contemporary pop song has a much greater chance of being used than let's say a 1960s style folk protest song. The majority of shows and films take place in current times, today. Therefore, the music of today has the biggest market and therefore the highest probability of being used. Duh. However, if you think strategically about the music you're creating, you might want to create music, create some that's in your comfort zone and is also in a niche where you can be the big fish in a small pond. Far fewer opportunities, yes, but much less competition in the various catalogs that are out there going to the supervisors who are looking for that niche music. So the sweet spot would be to create music that you're good at making, but is also in a niche, but a, <laughs> put a nice, but a niche that gets used a lot. If you watch what's out in the marketplace, trends are sort of obvious. And sometimes you'll notice there are a lot of shows and films in production from a certain decade. Remember the 70s show? What types of music were popular in those decades? Pro tip, write this one down. Use IMDB, um, you may need to upgrade to IMDD, IMDB Pro, and Variety to see what's in pre-production, what's currently in production or in post-production, and use that intel to spot trends. If you wait until the shows or films are out, you've already missed the boat. Got it? Let's think about that. So, you know, if you think, well, I'm watching a lot of TV and I can see that a lot of shows are taking place in the 80s right now, well, those shows, unless they get picked up for subsequent seasons, you know, are going to be off the air. Um, some will get picked up, some won't. So take a look at IMDb Pro and Variety and look for trends about when shows are out there for, especially for the, uh, the decade stuff, you know, for the different eras of music. Um, also, you could think about, you know, watch the Travel Channel um, and, and look at the post-production and pre-production and in-production stuff on travel shows. Where are they going? That'll tell you what kind of instrumentals they need. So that information is out there. Trust me when I tell you that the production music libraries use that information. That's why they know what they know and why they reach out to Taxi and ask for what they ask for some of the time, if not a lot of the time. So there you go. All right. Myth number two. We're really burning through these babies. When a production music library signs your music, the very next thing they do is start knocking on doors, making phone calls, and sending emails to every music supervisor they know 
to get them excited about using your new song or instrumental. True or false? Eh, false. Man, I miss having the roadcaster here. I need sound effects. So, unless the music library is pitching songs to a particular show that they already have a relationship with, the chances are that when your music is signed, it goes into a catalog and just sits there until the day when a music supervisor contacts the library and asks, do you have any XYZ type of music? They might also send a brief that describes a scene and the type of music they think would work best in that scene. If you're creating instrumental music, oftentimes the music library gives the entire catalog to a production company to put into a digital bin, which all the editors on that particular show or a group of shows can access to find music while they're in, while they're in the process of lay, laying in the music while they're editing, okay? So in general, when your music gets signed by a music library, the process through which it gets picked for a scene is more like filling needs in the form of inbound requests rather than pitching to hundreds or thousands of people to see who might need that type of music at that particular moment in time, right? Your music could just sit in that catalog for weeks or months or even years before it gets used, depending largely on the inbound requests um, and needs. You could land a big TV commercial three weeks, three months, or three years after your music gets added to that catalog, or you could start getting a string of TV placements shortly after the deal is signed. So there you go. It's going to get signed, and more often than not, it gets put in the catalog, and it just sits there and waits until the day that somebody asks for that type of music. Um, at the end of today's show, myth number 10 is a really long explanation and something that I need every single person watching the show to listen to carefully. Um, I'm not going to give you a hint, but I will tell you that it's one of the more powerful pieces of information I've given out on Taxi TV in a while, and you guys really, really need to stick around to hear that because your jaw is going to drop. Of course, I'm going to follow it up by something less jaw-dropping with a big happy face on it right after that so we can end the show on a high note. Marion Laird taking notes. Marion, why does that not surprise me even a little bit? <laughs> Good job. All right. Um, wow, how am I doing? I'm only seven minutes in and I'm already on myth, myth number three. <laughs> this is going to be a really short show tonight. I mean today. Myth number three. Music supervisors are like A&R people. It's amazing how many people think they are. They think they're like, you know, kingmakers or something. If one of them, meaning an A&R person, hears your music and loves it, that could be a career launching event. Eh, false. Most of the time. There are exceptions to everything, but the vast, vast, vast majority of time, A&R people are looking for music that's so catchy um, a and R people. This is A and R people, not supervisors. A and R people at record companies are looking for music that's so catchy and appeals to so many people that it'll go viral and become a hit. Music supervisors, on the other hand, are looking to fill a need and or solve a problem. It's funny. A lot of supervisors I know actually use that phrase. We're in the business of solving problems. For example, a supervisor might say, "I have a scene with a big emotional breakup in it." but it needs to feel more emotional. So I need to find a really emotional song about heartbreak or emotional pain or being alone or missing somebody. It should probably be a tender, heartfelt ballad, acoustic piano or guitar based with a female vocal because the character the song represents is a female and in a perfect world, the song's story slash lyric will end with a resolve to get through the pain. That's not at all how A&R people look for songs. They will more than likely put the word out to publishers by saying something like this. This is actually really, really close to the way label people put out a brief. They don't even call it a brief, but when they put out the word to publishers, they're looking for stuff. This is all you're going to get. This is actually a little more than you're going to get if you're a publisher. Looking for up-tempo hits for Pink's next record. 
a lot of times that's all they put out. <laughs> that's literally it. In my case, I wrote, looking for songs in the style of a modern version of Get This Party Started, fun, sassy, and not too cerebral. So yeah, that, that's all that A&R people um, get on their desk from publishers. While getting a placement in a big TV show or especially a big TV commercial could launch your career, in reality, it's a pretty rare occurrence. Remember Feist's song, One, Two, Three, Four? That became a hit after appearing in the Apple commercial. Gosh, that was like, what, 15, 20 years ago already? Uh, and there have been a handful of others, but I wouldn't hold out hope that getting one song licensed in a TV show, a film, or a commercial will launch your career to the extent that getting a song cut by a major label artist probably would. So there you go. A&R people and music supervisors, not the same. Myth number four. Man, I wish I had the roadcaster here so I could play a drum roll or something. Myth number four, instrumental cues that demonstrate incredible compositional skills will invariably get chosen over cues that are compositionally less impressive. False. Keep it simple, stupid. Not you, I mean, in general. I'm just using stupid in the kindest sense. Kiss, you know, we've all heard that. Keep it simple, stupid. Your music's job is to support a mood or emotion and not steal the scene. The busier, more complicated, maybe even more impressive it is, the higher the likelihood uh, it could distract viewers from the storyline or the dialogue. And that in the world of TV and film is a mortal sin. If it's so good that the viewers notice it, that's a bad thing. In the vast majority of scenes, the last thing the director or producer wants is to have the music get noticed while the actors and story fade into the background. Of course, when I go to the movies, it's all about the music, <laughs> uh, but I'm an exception. Uh, and there are exceptions, it says so right here on this piece of paper. There are exceptions, but they would be very small by percentage of times that they would happen. If your composition is complex, it will likely get passed over. If it's, more, uh, if it's on the more simple side, uh, it increases your chances of it getting used. Lots of our most successful members have reported that their alt mixes that are stripped down versions of their full mixes are most often the ones that get used. They also report that, there are so, that they're sometimes bemused, that the compositions that they're most proud of don't get used, and the idiotically simple tracks that they banged out in no time at all are the ones that get used most often and make them the most money. So there you have it. That was myth number four. Tanya says, I was watching Love is Blind today and I totally listened to the music. There you go. Um, moving on. Myth number five. If a music supervisor hears your song or instrumental and it's almost perfect for what they need, they'll reach out to you and give you a chance to fix it so they can use it. False, but we all wish that was true, right? 99.9% um, .9 of the time, I know because I've done the math, they don't have the time to wait for you to fix it. And they don't know if your fix will make it better or potentially even worse. And they almost always have plenty of other options. So why would they bother to say, you know, I love this, it's really good, but the vocal's a little pitchy in the chorus. Can you go back and fix that? And when you do and you remix it, can you bring the drums up a little bit and the guitar down a little bit? Yeah, sure, no problem. I'll get that right back to you in a couple hours. Tick tock, tick tock, and they're waiting and they're waiting. Oh man, you know, I was waiting for a new microphone to come in so I could re sing that vocal. Uh, and I, you know, had to go to work early this morning. And by the time I finished doing the vocal, it was two o'clock in the morning and I just didn't have it in me to get a good mix. So you're going to get it in like 24 hours. That doesn't cut it. They will literally just move on to the next thing because, generally speaking, they have plenty of other options. So there you go. Music supervisors will not, even if they think your song or your instrumental is almost perfect and just needs a little bit of fixing, 
They won't give you the time to do it. They're just going to move on. Myth number six. The audio quality of each song or instrumental you create has to sound spectacular. Eh, false. What you say? False? How can that be, Michael? Well, the quality of the audio needs to sound appropriately good and right for the type of music it is. Think about this. Imagine a Neil Young song that had a slick punch, had the slick punch and sparkle of an Ariana Grande single or vice versa. Think about that. A Neil Young, I can't talk, it's too late. A Neil Young song engineered and produced to the, the caliber of an Ariana Grande song. Wouldn't work, right? Same thing in reverse. Take one of Ariana's songs and produce it in Neil Young style. <laughs> Put a Neil Young vocal. <laughs> Neil Young vocal delivery on an Ariana Grande song. That would be pretty spectacular. So, no, not going to work. Um, Lo-fi could be appropriate for some styles and artists, but there's lo-fi when it's intentional, and there's also lo-fi when it's not intentional, as in a bad-sounding demo. So, you know, people on the receiving end of music industry pros, they can tell when the lo-fi music you create was intended to be that way because it fits the genre. And uh, they can tell when it's lo-fi because your mix is bad or your vocal performance is not up to snuff. So you can't fool them. So there you go. That's myth number six. The audio quality of each song or instr instrumental you create has to sound spectacular. Spectacular, not true. Myth number seven. Music supervisors are looking for songs that sound like hits. False. Music supervisors care far more about finding songs that work to enhance and support the emotion, mood, and vibe of the scene than they do about finding hits. As a matter of fact, if a song sounds like a hit, it might be so good that it could actually, once again, distract viewers from what's happening in the scene. Uh, there are some exceptions, like when a song has already been a hit, that's a good exception. Um, and it's used because it's already familiar to listeners and the familiarity factor might enhance the scene. So that is an exception when they will go with a, a, a hit, but it's an existing hit, not a song that sounds like it could be a hit from an unknown artist. Um, those situations, oh, those situations are often in a montage when they do go with a hit. Often found in a montage, which is one of those scenes in a TV show, usually at the end of the show, when it's a bunch of video but no dialogue and the song completes the story. The song tells the story that the dialogue would if it were in there and they're going from, you know, Here's the guy thinking about his girlfriend that left him, and here's the girl walking away on a rainy night down the street with no umbrella, getting soaking wet, thinking, maybe I should have hung on for another month and given him another chance. Nah, I don't think so. The guy was probably a loser. I wouldn't give him another chance. Anyway, uh, oh, here's an example. Lo and behold, I did an example. An example could be a road trip scene with the characters heading out on the road to go to a bachelor party in Las Vegas, and Viva Las Vegas by none other than Elvis Presley is playing loudly and in the clear as the characters put the top of their classic 65 Mustang down and hit the road. Party time. Any song about Las Vegas could potentially work there, but Viva Las Vegas would work best because the audience knows it so well that it adds extra emotional punch to the scene, right? Half the audience is kind of singing along as they're watching. Maybe most of the audience. All right, myth number eight. All production music libraries are basically the same. Once again, false Aruni. All production music libraries are not the same. A library A might have a bunch of reality show clients that need a lot of instrumental cues. Library B might have a lot of clients that produce TV dramas and need a lot of songs versus instrumentals. Library C could have a lot of clients who produce TV commercials and need a lot of simple, punchy, positive, uplifting songs and instrumental tracks. 
Library D, on the other hand, might cater to content producers who post videos on YouTube or create wedding or corporate videos. Library D might have a lot of foreign clients. Oops, sorry, that should be Library E. Might have a lot of foreign clients who need indigenous music from countries all over the world. And then there are music libraries that have hundreds of clients from all over the spectrum and have a massive catalog in the hundreds of thousands of tracks and songs that can cover virtually any one of their clients' needs. Those are very, very few and far between. Um, and oftentimes, those companies have sub-publishing deals with smaller libraries of all different types of music to cover the entire spectrum of what their clients need. There are also libraries that are very, very picky about what they sign. Most libraries say they're really picky about what they sign, but you know what? Go listen to the music on their website and you will see just exactly how picky they are or how picky they are not. Um, other libraries will sign almost anything offered to them. Uh, whoops, I missed a line here. There are also libraries very picky about what they sign and their super high quality is the thing that sets them the part, apart. That's part of their branding. Um, other libraries will sign almost anything offered to them and quantity is far more important than quality. I don't know if you wanna be in one of those, the, the quantity more than quality libraries. They might not attract high level clients and therefore the music in those catalogs doesn't typically get top dollar. There are also subcategories within different types of libraries. For instance, a library might specialize in instrumental cues for TV shows, but their client, uh, client base produces a lot of reality shows for BET. So they need a lot of music that fits those shows and the demographic that watches those shows. Another library might also work with a lot of TV shows, but they're primarily, uh, the shows end up on the sci-fi channel. And therefore that's a different demographic, a different type of show, and therefore they need music that has kind of a science-y vibe, you know, wah, 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 that kind of stuff. Arpeggiated science music. So the bottom line is your time would be well spent researching the libraries you're interested in signing with to see what type of placements they get to see if your music is a good fit for the type of business they typically do. That's a really important thing to remember. Research the companies. If somebody offers you a deal, go to their website and check out the types of placements they have. If the vast majority of their placements are songs in you know 60 minute dramas and you're doing mostly you know tension cues, eh they're probably gonna score the show and not leave. Those types of shows are generally scored and they don't need a lot of tension cues, right? But if you're somebody who does songs and probably 80% of their business is getting songs placed in montages um, on 60 minute dramas, then go for it. That's a library you'd wanna be in. We're up already. Oh my gosh, this is going to be a really short episode. We're up to myth number nine. If your song is amazingly, awesomely wonderful, a music supervisor will find a way to get it into the project. False. Imagine this, a music supervisor saying to an executive producer or the director of a film that they're working on, I love this song so much that it doesn't even matter if it works in the scene or not. It's just so good and I love it so much we should use it anyway. <laughs> that just doesn't happen. It doesn't. Why would anybody risk their job as a music supervisor just because they love a song? Play it in your car, listen to it at home, throw your earbuds in while you're jogging and listen to it, but don't try and twist the arm of a director or producer to get it into a TV show or a movie where it just doesn't fit the scene. They don't do that. They may listen to it on a personal level, but they're not gonna cram it into a scene. All right, folks, this is the big one. Glad y'all stuck around for 24 minutes and 37 seconds. This is myth number 10. You don't need to know how the business side of the film and TV music industry works. Creating great music is all you need to do. False. 
We know the taxi members don't love it when they see language like this in our industry listings. I'm going to share some quotes from our industry listings. Pay careful attention, ladies and gentlemen. Important note. This library offers an exclusive deal and has a strong preference for signing material from songwriters who have worked for libraries and licensing companies in the past and understand how standard deals work. Another form of that same type of thing. Important note, this company has specifically asked that you only send unreleased songs that aren't already commercially available. If you've already released them on Spotify, Apple Music, etc., or if they're already published or administered by CD Baby Pro, TuneCore, etc., please don't submit them. Now, some of our members have let us know that they are not even a little bit happy that some of Taxi's clients ask us to put that language in our listings. And we're working on a solution right now as we speak, well, after I wake up tomorrow morning, um, that works for both the clients and our members. But I'd like you to read this email. Pay attention, okay? Stop the chatting in the chat room for a moment. You gotta listen to this letter. You're not gonna believe it. Um, I'd like to read you this letter, this email that we got from a client about 10 days ago who's a top editor of TV shows and is building his own catalog that's already being used by some of the production companies and TV shows that he works with, as well as other clients outside of his own stuff. And this is just one example of why it's important to know how the business works. All right, so today is what, the 21st? So yeah, we got this 10 days ago, February 11th, and this was addressed to Tom, who is our Senior Director of a and at Taxi, and he is the point person that deals with the industry people. And this library CEO slash highly, uh, I don't know, he's a big time editor, all right? He says, library is going great. I just signed and delivered it to my third company yesterday, meaning production company, and it's been in wide use at two companies for a while now. I'm expecting to sign a fourth company within the next two weeks. So he's talking companies, you know, not just a show, but production companies, and usually the shows that make reality shows, or the companies that make reality shows, do anywhere between like five and 10 at a time. They're not just working on one show. Um, so he goes on to say, I'm still a bit in the pitching to companies mode and we'll switch back to building the library after that. I'll also be putting the entire library up on my website for companies to search for all tracks. Everything is growing though, and I'll reach back out for more Taxi Composers tracks once I get to that next stage. I do have one concern with some of the taxi composers I've signed. Throughout the entire process of signing them, I've tried to be crystal clear that this is a non-exclusive production music library deal and not a sync deal where I'm pitching their material, uh, pitching their tracks individually to TV shows. Most seem to understand that. However, it's clear that some just don't get it. They've sent a lot of emails. Oh, they've sent a lot of emails asking if I've placed their songs in shows, etc., to which I respond and tell them how it all works. Their tracks are in the edit bays of large production companies making many, many TV shows, and their music may be used on any number of those shows for years and years to come. And it's non exclusive, so they can license that same music anywhere else they want. It's great for them. In the last month, I've had three composers pull tracks from the library, which is a very bad look for me with the companies I work with. I have to call the companies up and have them remove the tracks from their edit bays. However, inexplicably, one of your members just removed 51 tracks from my library. He emailed me many times previously saying he doesn't see any royalties yet. This member uh, is in Italy, by the way, so it's going to take him a lot longer to see royalties from being in U.S. shows than somebody in the U.S., probably like a year and a half, maybe even two years. So for all he knows, his stuff has been getting used and he doesn't know it yet because it just takes a long time for the performance royalties to make their way from the American PRO to the Italian PRO to his bank account. Anyway, um, 
says he hasn't seen any royalties yet. There must be some mistake. I explained twice exactly how the library works and that even if his tracks were used, it wouldn't show up for nine months, I think longer. And since they're non-exclusive, he has zero to lose. He still removed all of his tracks. Today, another taxi member informed me that he's removing his two tracks from the library. It's odd because he sent me a bunch of new tracks a couple of weeks ago that he was excited for me to listen to and hopefully add to the library. I now have to contact the production company I just signed the deal with and then had to contact them again to ask them to remove those two tracks, which makes me and my company look really unprofessional. In spite of me being as crystal clear as I can with taxi composers in all correspondence about what the deal is and what the deal isn't, going forward, I want to target the most experienced and professional composers who get, who get what this is and be clear with them at the outset as we can be so I'm not in this position as the library and my clients expand. Your thoughts, please, Tom? Thanks, signed, blah, 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 producer, editor. So now you've seen just one example of how a few taxi members who don't understand how the music library business operates and what the normal processes are can screw things up by number one, potentially killing a relationship with a great company that we worked hard to build a relationship with. Number two, potentially killing opportunities for all other members because these few people don't understand how the industry operates. Number three, they're almost certainly killing any chance they have of signing any deals with, the, with this company ever again. Number four, they're potentially killing their chances of signing with any other libraries that this editor slash music library CEO knows and might mention their names to. And if you think he wouldn't mention their names, he actually did in this letter, but I took them out to spare them the public embarrassment. Number five, potentially hurting Taxi's reputation in the industry as a whole and killing off relationships with a lot of the companies we work with, which could have a dramatic effect on the number of opportunities our members get, as well as the number of deals they sign and placements they get in the future. So. I'd like to know your thoughts on this. We're going to chat about it in a minute. Um, but before I do that, I want to read you a good email, okay? This one was sent Friday, February 18th at 4.34 p.m. Subject line, hey, check this out. If anyone has, and this is from a music library CEO as well, if anyone has any doubt that taxi members are pretty effing amazing, uh, this would end that doubt right away. I've spent the past month or so working on a four volume trailer series and it literally consumed me. And it's all from taxi members, 90% of which are new composers to me. So there, there's more in the email, but it's nothing that would be particularly interesting to you guys. So there you go, the good, the bad, and the ugly. So what do you guys think? Uh, I know that our members are not very happy that probably, I'm guessing 10% of our listings, uh, the companies will ask us to put that language in there. Here, I'll read it once again. Let me go find it in my 13 pages of notes. Here we go. Uh, this company offers an exclusive deal and has a strong preference for signing material from songwriters, uh, it could plug in uh, composers as well, who've worked for libraries and licensing companies in the past and understand how standard deals work. If you don't have that experience and you don't know the drill on typical deals, they politely ask that you don't submit to this request. We just had a guy uh, demand a refund the other day because I'm not allowed to submit my music to all your listings and I wasn't told that up front. Well, frankly, this is something that in 30 years of taxi being in existence, we've just started running into in the last year. Um, it's probably because so many of our members are now getting deals, but we're, 
getting people who are not experienced deals and deal offers and they're doing some pretty schmucky things and it makes all the rest of us look bad. So uh, what do you guys think? I want to see your feedback. Elliot says, I made a big mistake with the music library once. It was because I knew nothing. I was an idiot. Thank God Taxi educates us. Thank you for saying that, Elliot. Uh, Alan or Alan says, yep, I totally understand the library's point of view. Um, <laughs> Mary, very pragmatic advice. Submit the tracks, get the tracks signed, then leave the tracks in the library. And it's not just that. It's sometimes people will call up these libraries um, after they get an email with a deal offer and say, it's an exclusive deal. I would never sign an exclusive deal. But the listing said the word exclusive in all caps two or three times in the listing. They knew they were submitting for an exclusive deal and when they were offered an exclusive deal, they didn't want to sign it. That's just one of many of the types of things I've heard. Um, Greg Carosa, hey Carosa, how are you buddy? Uh, that language is good by me. I think too many composers are holding their work too dear. If you sign a deal, put a bunch of tracks in the library, it doesn't pan out, just forget about it and write more. Absolutely, you know what? I imagine that some of these people that are pulling their tracks out are thinking, oh, I've got a, a, an offer for these same tracks from another library, but the other library is exclusive, so I'm gonna pull them out of the non-exclusive library. Well, you've burned a bridge, you've created a, a bad name for yourself with at least one person and probably more down the line. And you know what? If the exclusive library wants some music like that, make more of it. Then you've got it in two places, right? Carosa says yes. Uh, Dan Weber, oh, hang on there. Dan Weber says, if some doubters just caught the right info on the right day, things could go differently for them. That's why paying it forward is so, so important. Yep. Uh, those emails, Martin Frog says, uh, those emails say it all. Listen and pay attention when people are trying to educate you. Yeah, the problem is the libraries call us up and they're pissed. Why don't your members read this stuff? Why don't you tell your members this? We do. I constantly tell people on Taxi TV. We tell them at the road rally. We tell them in the newsletter. We tell them in the forum wherever else we tell them. we try to educate our members about this stuff every way we possibly can but you know what most people don't watch taxi tv if you could believe that uh, most people don't read the newsletter most people don't read the emails we send they just make music live in their own little world and think i make great music i'm going to submit it and they don't know anything about how the industry works and those are the people that are causing problems um, let's see, uh, <laughs> the legato fox says, reading is fundamental. Why, yes it is. Um, and don't bug the library. Marion's right about that. The, excuse me, the last thing libraries want is to be answering emails all day when they should be out pitching music and making money for people. I've got a pinched nerve in my neck. It hurts like heck. Um, What's an example of doing something schmucky? Go watch the replay of this video and you'll hear about it. Um, Glenn Ruger says it's the long game. Absolutely right. Um, whoops. Having problems with my scroll. It's important to have a good reputation with libraries. Yeah, you know what? About seven or eight years ago, I called a friend of mine who owns a music library and said, you've got to check out this songwriter. The guy is like a once every three year, every five year find. He's never gotten anything in a library, never had a placement in his life, and he's a natural. This guy, everything he writes is like perfect for placements. So uh, I connected that taxi member with my library owner friend who was exactly the right library type of library, which we talked about before, uh, for this person. And my library owner friend called me up. He said, wow, I can't believe that out of all the libraries that you know, you thought of me and I am so grateful for that. 
this guy is truly special. I'll be able to license the hell out of his stuff, blah, blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, the problematic emails started coming. The problematic phone calls started happening. Little threats. If you don't do this, then I'm going to do that. About two, three months later, I was in an industry event, you know, where they have all the round tables that hold 10 people each. And I happened to be at a table and across the table from me was my friend who owns that music library that had the bad experience with that schmucky guy. And uh, he was telling all the other library owners at the table about this guy. And the reaction was, well, good thing you told me. I ain't never signing that guy. So there you go. It's not like there's an official blacklist out there, but uh, word does get around. None of these people want to spend the time dealing with problematic people. They want to work with composers and songwriters who understand what the norms are in the industry, how the industry works, and are a pleasure to work with, that meet deadlines, don't hassle them, don't send emails all the time asking why haven't you gotten my stuff placed. They know the drill. That's who they want to work with. Paul Smith uh, I have, says, I have to trust Taxi has vetted the supervisors so anything I submit to them are good to go. Leave them, let them sit there until someone, I, I, I see what he's saying. He means the libraries, not supervisors. Let them sit there till some, someone finds a use for it, uh, move on to writing something else. Yeah, you get it, Paul. Totally get it. Rolf, signing in from Germany. Hello, Rolf. How are you? Good to see you in the room. Um, <laughs> Marion's got inky fingers from uh, taking all the notes. Glad you're taking notes. Marion, maybe you should have been a court reporter. <laughs> Alan Ruta says, I'm trying to learn about how all this works. I'm fairly new and I'm, a one and I'm unaware how to make this work. Well, keep watching Taxi TV, read the newsletter every month, hang out on the Taxi Forum, learn from your fellow members, Never be embarrassed to ask questions because no question is too silly to ask. There are always people in the forum who are super nice, super knowledgeable, and extremely generous with, with what they've learned along the way, and they're very willing to share that knowledge with you. Uh, the Taxi Forum is one of the greatest resources for people wanting to get into the sync business anywhere on the planet. Anybody who's used it would tell you that. Um, Marion says, remember, it's a long game, not a get-rich-quick scheme, that's for sure. Um, also, a forward doesn't necessarily mean a piece will be signed. True, true. Um, court reporters need to read shorthand. I'm sure it can't be that hard to learn, Marion. <laughs> you speak French, right? <laughs> um, Greg Carosa says, a huge advantage of taxi is that they vet the libraries. Yep, that's true. Uh, where can you access the Taxi Forum? I'm so glad you asked, David. You can access it at forums with an S dot taxi dot com. Uh, wow. Best vocal coach says, Michael, I met you in Vegas when Ladere Guzman had you speak there. Oh my goodness. I can't believe it. I actually haven't thought of Ladair in probably 15 or more years. And I was in my car about three or four weeks ago. I don't know why, but all of a sudden Ladair's face popped into my head. And I thought, you know, I should call that guy. So maybe I will. Thank you for saying that. Uh, woo! Je parle un petit peu. I know. Tu parles. <laughs> Je parle un petit peu aussi. <laughs> Very poorly. <laughs> oh, my God. Uh, what can those of us, this is from MJT, the PhD, what can those of us with no library experience, but we've done our research and know how things work, do to get our foot in the door when the door is being closed on us preemptively? It's not being closed on you preemptively. Everybody in the industry, everybody on the musician side, there's so many people that think 
that there are gatekeepers and people trying to keep you out when the exact opposite is true. They live and die by the quality and quantity of music that they find that is marketable. They are constantly looking for music that would work for their clients. They are not looking to keep you out. They're not closing doors in your face. They just want the music to come through an entity like Taxi that qualifies it and says, this is what you're looking for. It's on, on target for the style you need and it, the, it meets the quality bar that you've got. So therefore, you've asked for it, we're sending it to you, you should listen to it. That's how you get your foot through the door. Um, hey, Robin Pitts here, thank you for doing this. One question, uh, do you think it's better to join, whoops. Do you think it's better to join an American publishing company, for example, a B European artist that already has a publish. Oh, as as a European, I don't understand. There's a typo in there. Uh, to join an American publishing company, for example, as a European artist that already has a publisher in Europe, um, th that's a bigger question. That I, I need more facts than that. Um, Ask it in the taxi forum. Go under the general category in the taxi forum and, and lay it all out. Because if you've, you know, are you talking film TV? Uh, are you talking a non-exclusive deal that you've got with the publisher there? If you've already got a publisher in Europe, don't they have a clause? You know, if you're signed exclusively to a publisher in Europe, let's say as a songwriter, not for the film and TV side of the industry, um, that's an exclusive deal. It's probably an exclusive co-pub deal. And there's probably language in there that prevents you from signing with anybody else, um, American or otherwise. So I don't know. There are too many facts I don't know. Um, Marion had French in, in grade school on the East Coast. Then we moved to the West Coast and I had to learn Spanish. Makes perfect sense. Um, Marion, I took French 101 four years in a row and flunked it all four years, but I know how to ask where the bakery is, where the library is, and where the bathroom is, can do that really well. And I could say, I speak a little bit of French, and that's about all I know. Um, so you're saying I can submit to those listing that specifically say I can't submit to them because, because we have no experience. Um, look, we, we don't check when people submit to taxi, we're not going to reach out to every person and say, do you understand how the industry works? That would be unwieldy at, at least. Um, we have to trust that our members watch taxi TV, read the newsletter, read the emails, hang out on the forum and have learned how the industry works, uh, so that when somebody offers them a deal, they don't say something silly and blow the deal and blow their reputation and blow taxi's reputation and ruin opportunities for everybody else in the process. So you can submit to those listings. Just if a library offers you a deal and it's a library that you got to through taxi, know that we have vetted them already and that probably dozens, if not hundreds of our members have already signed with them over many, many years and have had good experiences. All that said, be totally prepared that when you sign, you know, one thing with one library, it's not going to be a life-changing experience. You need to get five things signed and then 10 things and 20 things, 50 things, 100 things. Get it signed with a bunch of different libraries because while one library is hot, another may run cold. While another one is starting to get warm, another one may be cooling off. So there's this yin and yang of how busy the libraries are. And if you get enough music and enough of them, it all sort of evens out and your income will stay level and probably incrementally grow every year. <laughs> and we're back to speaking French in the chat room. <laughs> oh, man. All right, I'm catching up with you guys. Give me a minute while I look at the chat room. MJT, thanks for saying that. That's, we really want our members 
to be successful. And the best thing we can do to help them in that endeavor is teach them how to make the right kind of music and know the, the ropes of the industry. <sighs> how do you think artificial intelligence will affect the music publishing business? Will it put songwriters out of business or can it be another tool for music creation? Honestly, I'm fairly well versed in AI as it relates to the choosing music side of things, not so much. I mean, I've read some articles, I've listened to a couple of pieces of music, I think Microsoft or somebody puts them out that um, a bot created. Um, who knows? I don't know. Um, I can tell you that there is one company that I'm extremely familiar with that doesn't try and pick hits using AI. It takes a reference and finds stuff that matches the reference. And you can decide if you want, while you're in the process of matching, are you looking more for a lyric match, more for a vibe match, more for a production match, more for a melodic match, more for a tempo match, and you get to pick and choose to what degree each of those things goes into the stew while the AI is looking for the match. Um, Ken Mesford says he just wrote the best song of his life thanks to the taxi screeners. Yay, thanks for saying that. Um, Bruce Hunt says he scored an indie film for his sister who produced and directed it. Family issues aside, it was a great lesson and the customer is always in charge. I had to rewrite nearly everything. Well, there you go. Because it's not about, your music may have been great, but it's not about great music. It's first and foremost, God, this pinched nerve in my neck is killing me. First and foremost, it's about the right music, which also has to be great. But you could have two pieces of music they're both equally wonderful. One of them fits the scene, the other one doesn't. Which one are they gonna use? Um, if a library, ooh, Hoot Gibson, how are you, Hoot? If a library says they'll be offering a deal, do you put your submissions of that song on hold? I wouldn't, honestly. Keep them going out there until you've got the contract in hand, keep pitching. Sometimes libraries will make an offer for a deal and they get busy on something and the contract doesn't show up for a week, a month, two months, three months. Just keep pitching that stuff. And if somebody else offers you a deal and library A comes back to you and says, hey, we wanted that stuff. You go, yeah, I know, but the deal didn't show up. Meanwhile, I kept pitching it. Somebody else got it. But you know what? I can make more of that stuff. And they'll go, oh, okay, make more. We want to hear it. Um, Hi, Michael. In a traditional 50-50 library deal, this is from uh, Ariel Cubria, 50-50 uh, library deal, if the library owns the publishing, they hold the master? Yes. They will, when they do a deal with you, they will get the publisher's share and they will get the master rights. Um, and you keep the writer's share, so if they're making money on publishing from the publisher's share, you're making, making an equal amount of money on the writer's share. Um, Rolf Shields says, yes, keep pitching. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. I need a drink from this really big bottle of fruit water. Can't find this in America. Actually, you can. There's an Israeli grocery store, like in Sherman Oaks, that sells this stuff. It's not great, but it doesn't suck. You're welcome, Ariel. Ken Messford says, he can't say enough about the custom critiques. I'm dumb for waiting so long to try. I encourage all of you, whenever you write a new piece of music, send it in for a custom critique. Um, it'll be the best 20 bucks you've ever spent on a critique. See that? Heidi Owen says, good to know, Ken. I've never done a custom. Um, I always talk about it with the folks in the marketing department, Taxi. We need to push the custom critiques more. And somehow we never get around to it. 
We have bigger fish to fry all the time and we just don't get around to that. Um, all right, well, I am extremely tired. It's almost 11 p.m. where I am at. I got up again at 6, 12 a.m. this morning and would love to go crawl into bed, watch a little Seinfeld on uh, Netflix and call it a day or call it a night. So thank you for showing up. I hope this was helpful, you guys. Um, uh, I thought about it long and hard as I wrote this stuff. I really did. I put a lot of effort into it. So I hope you guys um, got something out of it. Um, where am I? I am, in, I am 26 miles north of Tel Aviv, Israel right now. And you're in the Netherlands. I'm not. <laughs> anyway, you guys, great seeing you all. Well, seeing you in the chat. Uh, great hanging out with you. And we will be back next Monday with another incredibly insightful episode of Taxi TV. I look forward to seeing you that then. And with that, I bid you a fond farewell. Bye-bye. Don't forget to hit the like button and do a little alert bell if you're not already getting alerts. I'm to get better at fighting this.